Hi, welcome. I'm going to um, introduce the speaker for tonight. My name is Heather Roberge. I'm the Associate Vice Chair of the Department of Architecture here, and I have the great pleasure of introducing Naomi Pollock, um, a writer, an American-born writer living in Japan who um, holds dear an area of design that I also deeply appreciate, and that's product design, the subject of her new book called Made in Japan, Product Design from Across the Pacific. Um, uh, Ms. Pollock is a graduate of Dartmouth and the Harvard Graduate School of Design and Tokyo University. Um, she's trained as an architect and writes about design from Japan. Um, her work has appeared in numerous publications on both sides of the Pacific, including A Plus U, Dwell, Wallpaper, and Architectural Record, for whom she's a special international correspondent. In addition, she's the author of Modern Japanese House and Hitoshi Abe, and co-author of New Architecture in Japan. So her research <coughs> focuses on the um, the range of artifacts that constitute product design, from chairs to cutlery. And um, as many of you un undoubtedly know, Japan is a culture that has a deep appreciation for exceptional craftsmanship and industrial perfection. Um, so combining high aesthetic standards and cutting edge technology the product design of Japan turns everyday items into functional works of art um, that are both museum grade and also available for everyday use. So um, join me in welcoming Ms. Paul. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, I appreciate that. And I'd like to thank um, UCLA for inviting me to you uh, today on a subject that, as Heather said, has become very near and dear to my heart. Um, I am, as Heather said, the author of this book that came out um, in 2012, it's called Made in Japan, um, 100 New Products, and um, it, it features recent Japanese product design, in addition, as Heather said, I am a licensed architect from the United States, but I've been living in Japan on and off, on and off for over 20 years, mostly on. Um, prior to that time, I had been working in Manhattan for a large uh, design firm. And when my husband and I got the call to move to Japan, I envisioned I'd just make a simple lateral shift and drop myself into a uh, design firm in Tokyo and continue on my way. But as it turned out, um, I applied for a Japanese government scholarship and became a graduate student uh, once again. And that was really a very good thing because at that moment I knew almost nothing about Japan, let alone Japanese architecture and design. And I recall my very first meeting with my academic advisor, who was Professor Hiroshi Hara, who was one of the um, few practicing architects on the faculty at Tokyo University at that time. And uh, Professor Hara said to me, so what exactly is it that you want to study? And I said to him in my best Japanese, I said, well, what I really want to know is why do buildings in Japan look so strange? And coming from New York, of course, they did look strange. There were no consistent cornice lines. There were no street walls. There was no material compatibility whatsoever. And there were no um, urban devices to or, you know, organize the city. Uh, no parks, no significant waterfront. And it was really um, a bit chaotic to my New Yorker eyes. So my professor said, well, if you want to understand the new, you really have to look at the old. And since I studied archaeology undergraduate, that made a lot of sense to me, and I was perfectly happy to do that. And um, taking that advice to heart, I began researching my thesis on Minka farmhouses, which are these marvelous, marvelous farmhouses that were built all over Japan 
and they have these big, hulking thatch roofs that are just a, a sight to behold. So I was very happy to spend um, a couple of years running around looking at these houses and writing about them. But at the same time, I learned that architecture graduate students in Japan actually have a fair amount of free time on their hands. And there's a marvelous tradition in Japan that when an architect finishes a job, before they turn it over to their client, they will often have an open house. And they invite everybody they know. They invite architects, they invite journalists, they invite their parents, their teachers, their best friends, and students like me. So I made it my own private curriculum to go to every single open house that I was invited to. And um, a friend of mine in New York who was writing for a magazine, a design magazine, got wind of what I was doing. And she said to me, would you? Could you? And I said, of course I'll write an article for you. And so that was my first piece. It was an article called Letter Home from Tokyo. And that came out in the uh, early, well, about 1990 or so. And articles, in a funny way, I was to learn, of getting more articles. And before I knew it, I had been reborn as a journalist. So for all of you students out there who are in the midst of getting an MR degree of some sort, you'll be amazed to see where that degree can actually take you. Since that time, I've been writing about Japanese architecture and design uh, consistently. And I've covered a very wide variety of, of subjects. I've written about product design. I've written about um, historical matters. I've written on urban issues. I've written profiles of designers. But throughout my uh, writing career, there's been a uh, common thread, which is to focus on contemporary buildings. And um, as Heather said, my work has appeared in many different publications. Uh, but most consistently in uh, architectural record where I am the correspondent covering Japan. In addition, um, I'm the author of uh, a few books. The first book I wrote is called Modern Japanese House, and it featured 25 different houses. And this was a wonderful way to kind of pull together some of my observations from my academics as well as my reporting. And following that, um, since I worked with 24 different architects and almost as many photographers, I said to my publisher, that's it. The next book, I only want to write about one architect. And fortunately, she agreed. And we chose Hitoshi as the subject as a monograph. Shortly after that, I was the co-author of a book called New Architecture in Japan. And, you know, these kind of books, these survey books, come out about every five years or so. Uh, they quickly go out of date. But I particularly was uh, intrigued with this uh, book because the premise was to include 100 different buildings, which is quite a, very, quite a wide range and uh, large scope of projects. But my most recent book is this one, Made in Japan. Now, this book, it began with a eureka moment. I woke up one day, and I turned to my husband, and I said, I figured it out. I want to write a book that would be sold in an airport bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> and my husband said to me, well, now, that's a very interesting idea, but I don't think anyone buys books in airport bookstores anymore. And I said, well, yes, of course, you're right, but um, what I was really, what was encoded in my remark was I wanted to write a book about design that was geared towards a general audience. And I had a hunch that Japanese product design might be the ideal subject. Well, why did I think that? Well, first of all, I had noticed in my trips back to the United States or to Europe that there was this tremendous popularity and proliferation of the availability of Japanese goods outside of Japan. I, every museum shop I went to, every design store I went to, had a very generous selection of goods from Japan. And uh, there was also no shortage of media attention. I open up wallpaper every month, and there's something about Japan. But at the same time, I detected a, a paucity of information. And even people who go to the MoMA store, for example, and buy something beautiful from Japan, well, certainly they can appreciate the beauty, the cleverness, the craftsmanship and the functionality. But rarely do they know much about the designer. 
who made it, why they made it, what it was made for, or in fact that it was actually made initially for the Japanese domestic market, as is often the case. Let's take this product. It's called the Standing Rice Scoop. And um, early on in my research, I was in the gift shop at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and there it was, a whole shelf of them. Now, I found this a very curious phenomenon. Since Americans don't really eat that much Japanese rice, and they certainly don't use that many rice cookers, but there it was. So when I got back to Tokyo, um, I decided to find out more about this product. And I went and paid a visit to the company that manufactures it, which is a company called Marna. And they're based in Tokyo. They've been around since the mid-19th century when they started out making cleaning brushes. And um, I had a chance to meet with the designer and discuss this product with him. And they explained, he explained to me that um, this product really started out um, in response to a uh, request from a consumer. And that's often the way Japanese products start out. Apparently, Japanese consumers are really a very noisy bunch. So this consumer had written to Marna because um, they had a little problem on their hands. When they were using their rice scoop to take the rice from the rice cooker and put it in a rice bowl, in between servings, they had no place to put the rice scoop. And here I need to in, insert a little aside, which is that in Japan, there is an aversion to putting a utensil that's going to touch food that goes to the mouth directly, to put that utensil directly on a flat surface, like a counter or a tabletop. So you have to rest it on something. And so um, the standard rice cooker in Japan usually comes with a little sleeve on the side, and the rice scoop sits in there very, you know, happily. But quite honestly, it's not a very aesthetically pleasing solution, and I'm not even sure it's all that sanitary, because water and bits of rice can kind of collect at the bottom. So what this consumer wanted was a stand for their rice scoop. And as you can see, uh, Marna didn't give them a stand for the rice scoop. They gave them a rice scoop that stands. And this was not a major design breakthrough. I mean, the idea of a standing rice scoop was. But in terms of the actual form of the object, it is very much um, along the lines of uh, rice scoop shapes that have been fairly unchanged for, um, well, probably for centuries. Um, but they did tweak the design uh, to make it work. And if you look at the profile, you'll see it's very, very thin. And that elegant line was inspired by um, uh, traditional Japanese swords, is what the designer told me. And to balance that, it has this kind of beefy handle, which sits extremely comfortably in the hand. And more importantly, it enables the rice scoop to stand on its own. Well, my interest in this subject of product design um, actually dates back to the late 1990s when I was a guest curator for the Art Institute of Chicago on a two-part exhibit called Japan 2000. And the first half featured public architecture, including um, uh, the Sendai Stadium designed by Hitoshi Abe. And the second half focused on product design. Now, you know, a lot of those designers are no longer active, but that exhibit and experience of meeting those designers planted the seed in my head. Uh, as you can imagine, I've further cultivated my interest in product design by writing about buildings, because I spend a lot of time in architects' offices. And many architects um, are designing rather interesting objects or you know, really beautiful furniture for some of their jobs. Let's take the Ripples Bench by Toyo Ito, the architect Toyo Ito. Um, this was originally designed as street furniture uh, for a mixed-use development in the heart of Tokyo called Rapongi Hills. And um, to kind of make the world go around, the developer inserted a new street in the middle of this project that united the more residential components with the commercial components. And uh, the street is actually um, one of the nicest features of the development. It kind of meanders, and it's lined with cherry trees on either side, which are probably peaking right about now. Um, so to enliven the street even more, they commissioned a whole 
slew of designers to create street furniture, among them Toya Uta. So the original version of this bench was made of steel and concrete, which was you know, appropriately uh, appropriate response to the buildings on either side. Uh, but in sort of bowing politely to this more organic quality of the street itself, uh, Ito-san had this idea of um, this image of pebbles dropping in water and rings propagating outward. So um, that was his, his concept. And um, at some point after it had been uh, realized and was sitting on the street, um, the a representative from the Italian furniture maker form walked by and thought, well, this would be actually quite exquisite if we made it with wood. Fortunately, um, Ito-san agreed to that, and they made a couple of different versions that have uh, layers of either five or six different woods, each one made of a different color. And um, the wood lent itself very nicely to this idea of rings propagating outward, and that it could be sanded very smoothly um, to create these very lovely smooth um, surfaces inside the indentations. Now, I know that the placement of the, the discs looks a little bit random, but in fact it was extremely carefully studied so that the benches can align and create, well, an endless stream of ripples, basically. This is another product created by um, a, young art, a young firm in Tokyo called uh, Narusei Inokuma Architects. And um, they originally got the idea for this when a friend of theirs became engaged and came to their office one day and said, could you please create something wonderful that I can give to my fiancé as a gift? And the architect said, well, okay, sure. Um, we'll either create a lampshade or, or we'll create a tray. And the friend opted for the lampshade, but they liked the tray so much they went ahead and made a prototype. And as you can see, um, it is this very large platter. It measures 1.2 meters end to end. But the concept is that it has the place to hold the contents of an entire meal for four in one serving dish. And um, what was one of the most fascinating parts of this product, to my way of thinking, was talking to them about their design process. Because looking at their models and their sketches, which had squares and rectangles and circles of various sizes, and looking at how they had studied their relationship, it was really as though they were designing a building floor plan. Um, initially, a door manufacturer had expressed an interest in turning this um, into a mass-produced product, but uh, that has yet to happen. Um, so I'm still waiting. Um, this is another product by an architect. It's called Umbrella Tea House, and it's created by a uh, young Tokyo architect named Kazuhiro Yajima, who um, has always been fascinated with umbrellas. And when he was approached to design a temporary pavilion for a tea festival, he decided to, this, this was his big chance to turn an umbrella into architecture. So he teamed up with a um, traditional Kyoto umbrella maker and they created this um, portable room for the Japanese tea ceremony. Uh, as you can see, it's got this spoke-like structure that is a direct replica of uh, an umbrella, but blown up onto a larger scale. And then it's covered with um, fabric, but it's fabric with a paper-like quality. It almost looks like shoji. But perhaps one of its most interesting features, and you can kind of see it at the top, is this right here, which is a little strap. I think it's made out of leather. Um, like any umbrella, traditional umbrellas in Japan often have these leather straps so they could be hung from a wall. And um, Yajima explained to me that if you um, hook a fish, fish hook on it and give the fishing pole a big yank, the whole thing folds up like a giant umbrella. And unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to witness that in person, but I have seen it um, in a video, and it is truly an impressive sight. Well, like Umbrella Tea House, uh, many contemporary products in Japan are blending tradition and technology in terms of either what they look like, their aesthetics, or how they're made, as in this case, or in terms of the thought process behind their realization. 
This is a textile that uh, was created by Reiko Sudo, who heads up Nuno, which is a, a textile design concern, um, also based in Tokyo. And um, they create uh, really a wide array of very wonderful textiles. Um, this piece was created when her son was very young. And at that point, uh, they were doing, they, they were spending a lot of time with Peter Rabbit books. And if you're at all familiar with um, Peter Rabbit, you'll know that there's a somewhat tertiary character named Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, who is a hedgehog. Um, <coughs> and she uh, makes little appearances here and there. Well, um, Sudo san uh, was inspired by Mrs. Tiggy Winkle to create te a textile that would have the tactility of an animal's fur. And she began. Uh, this process by taking little tufts of cotton thread, normal cotton sewing thread, and coating it with a paste made from a root vegetable that's called konyaku in Japanese or devil's tongue in English. Um, and this uh, vegetable is, is a food stuff, it's eaten all the time, but it's also um, this paste with a traditional sealant that could be apply, applied to uh, paper umbrellas or um, straw raincoats to turn them into uh, either waterproof or water resistant. So Sudo-san took these little tufts of the stiffened threads and by hand she sewed them onto a piece of just you know, garden variety cotton cloth. And then she paid a visit to a um, uh, textile mill that she works with on and off in Yamanashi Prefecture. And she approached the technicians there and she said, could you please take these stiff fibers and could you weave stiff fibers like this into your standard cotton cloth? Well, initially, um, the technicians looked at her quizzically. But as is often the case in Japan, they agreed to give it a try. And in fact, their heavy duty looms were able to um, introduce this hard, these hardened threads into their cotton cloth without a hiccup. But once these rolls of fabric came off the loom, um, to complete the process, these little white threads, they were all continuous and woven in as a um, warp thread, weft thread. Um, and they all needed to be snipped. And the only way to do that was to cut them by hand. Now, when I heard that, I was quite astonished because that seemed like a monumental task. Um, and it, in fact, it really struck me as kind of anachronistic and out of time. But quite honestly, that level of handiwork is still very much alive and well in Japan. In many cases, depending on the medium, uh, working by hand enables a level of detail and precision that really isn't achievable with machines. But there's also this willingness in Japan to do things by hand that perhaps could even be done by a machine. And I believe that that willingness, that drive to do things by hand, actually is deeply rooted in uh, Japan's craft history. Well, as you may know, Japan has a tremendous history of handicrafts that have extends back centuries and have reached a very high level of refinement. Initially, this whole uh, notion of craft, of course, like anywhere, developed out of necessity. That here were communities that had to make objects for daily use. But Japan is an island nation, and there are only limited natural resources available. So um, the people who were making these objects learned quickly to become experts in those materials, whether they were wood, bamboo, or clay. And this expertise, they then passed down generation to generation to generation. And along with that expertise in the making of things was this um, notion of, well, design was kind of embedded in it. There was no sense of design versus making. It was all one discipline that uh, these craftspeople were taking on on their own. And even today in Japan, one often sees that there's little distinction between design and craft, between thinking and making. One legacy of this idea is the concept of monozukuri, which is a, I know it sounds like a lot of syllables, but it's actually a very simple word that means making things. However, embedded in that word is um, 
a philosophical point of view that is much, goes much more deeply than simply making things. It's really um, as much a mindset as it is a mode of working. Uh, it's a commitment to do one's best, no matter how hard or how much that entails. And in practical terms, that translates into this repeated cycle of making, evaluation, revision, making, evaluation, revision, with the goal of eventually making it as best as it possibly can be, or at least to try and go as close as possible. This is very much a craftsperson's way of thinking, but it's an approach that really dovetails very neatly with the design process as we know it. Um, this is a cell phone called X-Ray that was designed by Tokujin Yoshioka, who's one of Japan's best known product designers. And um, I heard from a number of different designers that, uh, you know, They've been commissioned by various cell phone companies in Japan um, because Japanese consumers or owners of cell phones tend to replace them every six months, which means that these cell phone companies are under constant pressure to produce newer, better, you know, more striking designs. And consequently, they're um, hiring a lot of product designers to help them achieve that goal. And so Tokujin um, thought, well, how am I going to make a cell phone that is like the likes of which have never been seen? And his idea was to create a phone with a see-through case. Now, being a very exacting person, he um, wasn't content to leave the inner workings of the phone to destiny. And he um, got right down and dirty with the cell phone engineers to make sure that all the parts inside were aesthetically pleasing, that the circuitry was laid out in an organized, uh, appealing way. I understand he even specified the font that could be used on the tiny wires. But perhaps this product illustrates the notion of monozukuri um, best in the discussion of the design of the actual case. And Tokujin explained to me that he created this case by, uh, with a, a prototype made of acrylic. And he had the acrylic equivalent of an X-Acto knife that he used just to pare away. And he used hand feel to create the perfect form. And so he would cut a little bit and then just sort of feel how it sat in his palm and then cut a little bit more. And he said that towards the end of this process, even removing a tenth of a millimeter, a tenth of a millimeter, could make a difference. Well, to get to that level of refinement, you know he had to go through many, many, many cycles of revision. In this product, what we see, then, is really a craftsperson's way of thinking, but it's applied to something that's mass-produced and machine-made. Another example of this idea of monozukuri is um, seen in this product, which is a tape dispenser called Notchless. And it is the work of a um, young designer named Mamoru Yasukuni. And Yasukuni-san um, started out in, not by studying architecture or design. Um, he may have studied art history, but I think it was philosophy or economics. Anyhow, something fairly unrelated. And he, um, after he graduated from university, he began working at an antique map store in the used book district of Tokyo. And I'm not sure, he never explained to me whether that job influenced his decision to design a um, tape dispenser, but it may have. Because he really felt that the world needed yet another tape dispenser. And the reason for this was he cannot stand, and he is very passionate about this, but he really can't stand the zigzag profile that results when you tear off a piece of tape. <laughs> he finds the zigzag line is visually just jarring to him. But perhaps even more egregious is that in the little corners are those tiny bits of adhesive, and then there's all the little bits of dirt that get stuck to the adhesive, and that just drives him berserk. So during the day, he was working at the map store. And for three years at night, he would come home and try to create the absolute perfect, perfect cutting edge. 
And finally, he reached that point, and then it took another year to um, get a patent for his cutting edge. And then finally, after that, he quit his day job and devoted himself fully to the tape dispenser. And at that point, he'd already decided he was going to make it out of extruded aluminum, as you can see here. And it has two plastic discs that hold the tape uh, in place. And it has this marvelous shape that looks like a roll of tape unfurling, but in fact, it's a completely functional design. He carefully studied each of those hills and valleys to make them the exact right shape to make it as easy as possible to tear off the tape. So all in, concept to completion, it took him six years to make this tape dispenser, which is kind of flabbergasting when you think about how long it takes to make a lot of buildings. Well, um, Yasukuni-san also exemplifies a category of designer that I describe in my book. I label them as the cottage industrialists. And um, these are a group of designers that I found to be particularly interesting. They're mostly uh, quite young, and um, they have grown up in the internet age completely. So for them, uh, the, they use the internet very actively in their process, first to source materials, then they will make the products on their own, and then they will sell them again on the internet. And, um, this is a young designer named Nobuhiro Sato, who was, uh, studied architecture at university. And then after he graduated, he um, worked a variety of design-related jobs. But eventually, he quit all of that and opened his own company, which is called Pull and Push Products, um, and he, um, where he makes all of, designs and makes all of his products. And he does, as I said, he buys his materials either on the internet or at um, the Japanese equivalent of Home Depot. And then he produces them in his studio and then either sells his products on his website or he has a tiny little store in northern Kyoto. It's only open on Saturday and Sunday afternoons. But if you find yourself in northern Kyoto on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, I wholeheartedly re recommend going to see him. And this is an example of a product that uh, he sells in his shop. It is basically a bag made from bags. And he um, had this idea that vinyl shopping bags, you know, the kind that we get at the grocery store almost every day, could be melted together to make a really nice, thick plastic. So he ordered vinyl bags in bulk and took them to his studio where he tried melting them in various ways. Um, he put them in the microwave, he put them on a cooktop, he dropped them in boiling water, but none of them achieved the desired effect. <coughs> so finally, he said, that's it, you know, I'm gonna iron them, and in fact, that worked very well. And they created this thick plastic, um, but they also caught a little bit of air in them, so you can see it's got this rather nice uh, texture to it. And once he had melted them together and the plastic had cooled, he could cut this new material to patterns that he made and then fuse the seams um, together to make the, to complete the bag. Well, his methods and his materials seem very far removed from traditional Japan, but in fact, his mentality, his way of making things is really, that's where it comes from. Japan's traditional crafts, as I said, have been around for centuries. But the modern idea of product design is actually relatively new. It came about in earnest after World War II. At that time, Japan was occupied by the U.S. forces, and the um, army came to Japan and brought various products with and took them to Japanese uh, appliance makers and so forth and said, you know, we need you to make these and for our uh, our troops who were stationed here. And so these Japanese companies started making a variety of, of uh, products that were, you know, copying the American models. And of course the Japanese consumers had access in due course to these things as well. And they were uh, very well received uh, because they were modern, they were convenient, and um, 
they pointed the way to the future, which was, I think, a very important time, I think, for these, uh, this community that was trying to rebuild itself after the tremendous devastation. And gradually, of course, as designs progressed, um, the uh, Japanese manufacturers began tweaking designs to make them more suitable for the Japanese lifestyle. Um, and a few decades later, um, some of these objects began being marketed outside of Japan. Perhaps the most famous one, of course, is the Walkman, which was created both for export and domestic use. And the um, popularity of Japanese design reached a real pinnacle overseas, however, after the Japanese bubble economy burst, which was in the early 1990s. Um, during the bubble period, that was the late 80s, early 90s, when Japan was extremely flush and consumers had a tremendous amount of disposable income, European goods became extremely popular. But after the economy dried up, um, these expensive imports were no longer a viable option, and um, it spawned, this trend spawned a whole outburst of um, new, new products that were created in Japan that were more suitable for the Japanese lifestyle that meshed well with Japanese aesthetics or the Japanese homes, and um, just reminded people in Japan of the great wealth of, of uh, their own creativity. And um, oftentimes this was manifested with stripping away of some of the decorative or uh, other um, ornamental qualities that characterize a lot of the imported goods. <coughs> Uh, for example, this is a toaster that's created by um, plus minus zero. And as you can see, it's, it's completely white, it's very simple, and it has room for one slice of toast, albeit a Japanese sli slice of bread, which is um, a lot thicker than uh, American supermarket bread. But it also, it, it, it represents a sort of an honesty of expression, um, an appealing away of all of that excess that had built up when the money was flowing so easily. Um, and in due, good, due, due course, these goods that were created to Japan also began to migrate across the Pacific. Well, despite the popularity of um, these products in the West, many of them were really, as I said before, created for Japan. They were created for Japan's physical, social, and cultural setting. Um, Perhaps the most important consideration for um, designers, whether they're architects or product designers, is the size of the space in Japan. And um, the, as I said, Japan is an island country, but it also has a spine of mountains running down the middle. So the amount of buildable area in Japan uh, in considering the size of the population and the size of the cities is actually very small. And as a result, um, people have less personal space. Um, not that that's considered a particular hardship, it's just a fact of life. And objects, as a result, tend to often be smaller than their Western counterparts. Um, and Japanese architects and designers have become real masters at mini miniaturization. As you can see here in this house that is designed by Atelier Bow Wow, um, the width of the house is you know, not much greater than the actual width of the door. And as you can imagine, with houses as small as this, um, objects have a very different relationship to rooms than they do in the West. Instead of rooms that have separate functions, so separate rooms for separate functions, multifunctional spaces are much more common. Um, and this is a concept that goes way, way back in Japan, but it is very much uh, in evidence today still. And it, um, it's really a very ingenious system because with one space, if you have um, objects or furniture that can be rotated, you can modify its use seasonally, daily, or even hourly. Um, futon are a perfect example. They can turn a sitting room into a sleeping room at night and then back to a sitting room in the morning. <coughs> And as you can imagine, with this rotating set of objects and furnishings coming in and out, the floor takes on a very different role. 
it's very much the constant, it's very much the platform on which all these daily activities are taking place. And this is, of course, a very strong difference with the residential floors in the, in the US, for example, where we really consider it a surface to walk on, a surface to put things on, but not a surface that our body is going to come into close contact with. And this idea of the floor as a platform um, extends, of course, for rooms like this where the floor is made of tatami, but it also is very evident in homes where the floors are made of wood or carpet as well. And um, this is one of the reasons why people in Japan still take their shoes off when they come home. Um, this is a pair of indoor shoes because people will take their shoes off and trade them for indoor shoes. And they are created by um, a young Tokyo design firm called Drill Design. And Drill was approached by a traditional sandal, or geta as they're called in Japanese, uh, sandal maker in Shizuoka Prefecture. And a typical geta is a slab of wood with a Y-shaped thong that fits between the toes. And um, the idea that the geta manufacturer had was to enlist the help of this young design firm to update their shoes and maybe make them a little bit more popular. So using themselves as guinea pigs, the designers tried various different ways to do that. And um, one of the best interventions, it's unfortunately invisible in this slide, but right under the ball of the foot, they inserted a wad of foam rubber. So the shoe actually bends as the foot moves. And then in lieu of the um, thong uh, construction on top, they put on this simple um, cover for the foot, which you know, their hope was that they would make a shoe that would be comfortable for people of all ages and that it would look stylish enough that it would look as good with jeans as it does with kimono. Well, like these shoes, two-piece, um, objects in any country are really encoded with a wealth of cultural information about their country of origin. And my first book, um, Modern Japanese House, looked at contemporary Japan through the lens of residential design. Similarly, Made in Japan looks at contemporary Japan through the lens of the products it creates. For example, um, this is a dish rack. It's called Round and Round. And it reveals quite a bit about Japanese kitchen culture if you look at it closely. It's created by a very small regional company in uh, Niigata Prefecture called Arnest, and they work primarily with their own in-house designers. Now, Niigata um, used to be Japan's sword-making center, but of course the need for swords has uh, trickled a bit. So today it's the country's cutlery capital. And um, the designer of this uh, dish rack took literally the form of a bamboo and string mat that's used to make rolled sushi. And it's, these mats are little, um, they're strips of bamboo that are held together with string, and you put the seaweed down and then the rice on top of that, and then you roll it to make um, rolled sushi. It's a very um, useful tool. But here, instead of using bamboo and string, they used steel bars, and they coated them with silicone. Uh, so what this means is that the dish rack can sit on top of the sink. And unlike the ones that you know stand up and have all those spooky things, it really is, it takes up very little vertical space, and it can accommodate you know pots of any size. It also means that one can effectively enlarge one's counter space because it is sturdy enough that you can, in fact, put a cutting board on it and cut something hard with your full weight. Um, and of course, as you can see in this picture, it, it can hold a hot pot, which is another nice uh, attribute. But perhaps its best feature is that when it's not in use, it, like the sushi mat, can be rolled up into a very tight coil and stowed away easily. Well, what does this tell us about the Japanese kitchen? It tells us that storage is minimal, and it tells us that space is small, and it tells us that a product that can be used in multiple ways is a real asset for the Japanese consumer. <coughs> This is a product called Pen Cut, and it 
tells us a little bit about Japanese writing culture. Um, it is made by a uh, stationary manufacturer based in Tokyo called Reimei Fuji, uh, a company that's been making writing utensils since 1890. And um, they had a designer who had this idea to create a series of products uh, that could fit inside a pen pouch. Uh, a word about pen pouches, um, they're ubiquitous in Japan. Almost everyone I know has one. And it's a habit, owning a, a pen pouch is a, a habit that starts early in Japan because um, many uh, public schools require students to bring their own pencils and crayons and stuff. And so of course they need, kids need something to put them in. And so that's how it starts and then it continues on from there. So um, they first created a, a series uh, called Pen Pass, which were these folding compasses that were wildly successful. And then based on that, they decided to create Pen Cut, which was a scissors that folds up to the size of a ballpoint pen. And as you can see on the, um, the slide, it has these, um, these clear plastic handles that slide out and they lock nicely into place. And then the blades are actually honed on both sides, so it's useful for righties and lefties, which is unusual. And when they're, um, it, when it's, you know, all set up to use, the size of the scissors is actually fairly close to a standard scissors size, so it's not like trying to cut with the little tiny miniature scissors, which are, is the more common solution to this problem. But when it's not in use, um, this cap fits on top and locks into place with this nice resounding click. So you know when you put your hand inside your pen pouch, you're not going to impale yourself. Um, sadly, I can tell you from personal experience that it will not pass airport security when leaving the United States. Japan is about 50-50. China, no problem. This is um, a product that I'm also very fond of. It's called Splash. And it is a good indicator about local climate in Japan. In Japan, it rains a lot. And as a result, people tend to own a lot more umbrellas than they do in the United States. So this um, designer, he's an independent designer in Tokyo named Yasuhiro Asano had the idea to create an umbrella holder. And as you can see, it's shaped, it looks like a drop of water um, hitting the ground. And it started out as a competition entry sponsored by Toyama Prefecture in northern Japan. And Toyama has a number of um, metal casting industries, or metal casting companies that are based there. So they held this competition to encourage young designers to create things using metal casting techniques. And Asano-san's idea, as I said, was to separate, uh, well, he wanted to create an umbrella holder that separates wets and dries. So his idea was by making this loopy profile, he could have the dries on the inside and the wets on the outside, or vice versa. But in any event, he could separate them. And then I think sort of, with an idea of making it look more umbrella-like. He, he took the two ends of this strip and fused them together and uh, put them on an angle. So it almost the whole thing had sort of a cone-like shape. And um, the prototype he made went on display in Toyama Prefecture, where it was spotted by uh, an executive from a design production company in Tokyo. And he was very intrigued with Asano's design, but he knew it needed a little bit of tweaking. So if he was going to bring it to market, he, they had to adjust the design. Uh, part of the problem was the aluminum, if it wasn't sanded beautifully by hand, and it needed to be by hand because the form was so complicated, it actually tore the umbrellas. And then the form itself was so complicated, it was going to be very difficult to mass produce in cast aluminum. So they simplified the shape and made it just a straight up and down and um, swapped metal, the metal out for rubber, sorry, Toyama, um, which comes in a rainbow of colors. So it has this very um, light, playful look uh, that is actually very attractive, even if there aren't any umbrellas in it. Plus, the rubber is so heavy, it can double as a doorstop. 
Well, as I said, Splash ended up in rubber, but the intention of the initial competition was to unite these product designers with local industries. And this is a trend that I've observed in many places in Japan, where many regional factories are pairing up with external design talent in the hope that they can create products that address changes in the market and enable them to keep producing their goods in Japan. Uh, because many of them have technology that is used to create one thing, but if there's no market for that object, then they have to repurpose the technology. So these are a set of ice cream scoops that were um, made by a, um, another metal casting company in um, Toyama called Takato Lemnos. And they were designed by an, a Tokyo architect named Naoki Terada. And um, Takato Lemnos had really gotten, his, had been very successful in creating um, cast metal bronze objects mostly for um, Buddhist altars that people would use at home. But young people in Japan are not buying altars the way their parents and grandparents did. So the need for these accoutrements for the altars has diminished quite a bit. And yet um, the company had developed this technology for casting. They really perfected it. So they started inviting a number of different designers um, to do various things. And they approached Tarabasan and said, we'd like you to design either chopstick rests or a bottle holder or a bottle opener, that's what it was. And um, Tarabasan said, well, you know, there are actually a lot of really nice chopstick rests out there, so maybe not. And um, he likes ice cream a lot. So he went back to the company and he said, how about if we create ice cream scoops instead? And his idea was to make them out of cast aluminum. And as you know, aluminum is a heat transferring material. So it takes, the spoon can actually take the warmth from the hand and use it to soften the ice cream. Um, and as I said, he's a, quite an ice cream connoisseur. So one scoop wasn't enough. He had to make three. Uh, the top one is a chisel. The middle one is the Japanese fork, which combines spoon and fork. And then the bottom one is the classic uh, figure eight. And they were all designed for um, frozen desserts with different kinds of consistencies. Um, this is a product called Airbase that's created by Torasu Architects in Tokyo. And they're very active in the product design world. And it was made at the bidding of an initiative called um, Kami Kosakujo, or Paper Workshop, which is uh, spearheaded by a um, paper processing plant on the outskirts of Tokyo. By processing, I mean they don't actually make the paper, but they turn reams and reams of paper into candy bar wrappers and calendars. And they, do, they cut and they print and do everything that you need to do to paper. But um, a lot of their competitors had decided to just <coughs> pick up and move to China where, or other parts of Asia where they could get the job done for a lot less money. However, this company, Fukunada Shiko, said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, we want to stay here and we want to continue to use our machines and make our own products. Um, but they knew they had to do something to kind of invigorate their business. So, uh, under the aegis of this paper workshop initiative, they began inviting designers to come and tour their factory. And they invite about 10 every year. Architects, product designers, artists, all kinds of people. And um, I've been on the tour, and it's quite impressive. Um, it's a real throwback. There are all these big machines that have been in use since the 50s and 60s, and they're all still working just fine. Uh, and these designers will come, and they'll have um, an explanation of all the different machines. And then they're sent on their way and told to come back with a new product. And then of those 10 or so products that are designed every year, the company will put one or two that they like best in production. And Airbase um, starts out as a flat piece of paper, about the size of a piece of origami paper. And it's scored with literally hundreds of tiny cuts so that when you pull gently on it, it becomes this three-dimensional object, which is, on the one hand, you know, it's, it's uh, 
Well, it's kind of a, you know, one wonders how one would use this. On the other hand, it's quite a spectacular object, and um, it, it's more useful than one would think. Uh, because it takes a flat piece of paper and basically turns it into a paper mesh bowl. Well, in closing, I want to say a word about the words that titled my book. And these are the 100 <coughs> objects in my book. Um, initially, I really didn't like this title at all. But it was chosen by my publisher, so I was kind of stuck with it. For me, the words made in Japan had a real ring of outsiderness, and that was completely against my intention. Um, I really wanted to take the reader inside Japan and look at the products that Japan's creating and say, here's, what, here's what's being made and here's why, and, and relate it to Japanese um, culture, as I said. And it also um, didn't fit well with me because it kind of evoked images of transistor radios and cheap toys that I'd grown up with in the U.S. But the truth is, I've actually grown to love this title. It's very easy to remember. It rolls off the tongue. But more importantly, the words made in Japan have taken on an entirely new meaning for me. They're not simply a geographic identification. Today, those words embody something that is entirely different. They embody traits that are valued in Japan. Japan is a country that esteems craft in tandem with industrial manufacture. Japan is a country where people take pride in their work. And Japan is a country where quality still really matters. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed my remarks. And I would be happy to take any questions. meant to grow with the user. And by that I mean it comes as a kit of parts, comes in the mail, sent. And then it can be assembled very quickly by the individual. And the parts can be swapped out. So for example, if it was purchased for a child and the child grew, you could take the, the chassis, as it were, of the bike out and put it in a new piece. Um, you can, it comes with all various kinds of accoutrements you can attach to it. And um, perhaps most wonderful is that when it's no longer needed, it completely decomposes, so you can recycle all the components separately. Um, where is it? Yeah, right there. That one, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious about the knives. <laughs> the bottom row, the Yeah. Uh, they're made in, in Niigata Prefecture, the cutlery capital, and um, they're um, they're very uh, they're really beautiful, and they're um, they were studied very carefully, so that the blade and the handle are one integrated piece made out of steel, and um, the uh, handles were uh, particularly appealing to me because they are so ergonomic. And of course, you know, knives and Japanese cuisine um, go hand in hand, as it were. Um, they are a very critical component to making Japanese food is having the correct knives and using the correct knives for particular dishes. What was your methodology to choose these objects? Because they have probably more than 100 names. What was your criteria? Well, my main criteria was I wanted to choose objects, as I said, that illustrate something about the culture. Um, I feel that uh, a lot of people today, their gateway experience of Japan is anime or manga. And I felt that 
Japan has this incredibly rich culture, and so I chose objects by and large, not exclusively, that to me exemplified that culture. So I was often shown beautiful things that were made, designed by Japanese designers, sometimes even manufactured by Japanese manufacturers, but you know, if it didn't really say something special to me, I couldn't use it. I remember in particular talking to one designer who created a, a, a car seat for a child. And it was really the most beautiful car seat I'd ever seen. And I kept asking him, isn't there something about Japan? Isn't there some law in Japan that you've responded to? No. Everything was no, 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 no. And at the end of the day, I just said, as much as I love this product, I really can't put it in the book. Um, I think that there is a lot of magnificent packaging and there is a, there are a lot of disposable goods. I also think that there is a trend to move away from that and a lot of Japanese consumers um, are not quite so happy with all the packaging or um, would prefer to buy an object that they could use for a long time. In many cases when I would interview the designers I would say to them, well what is your criteria for good design? And I would say, you know, I got lots of different answers to that question, but the one that was most consistent was um, if a product is well designed, it will be used for a long time. To what degree did you, did you look at the product in the international context at all? Are they the narrative thing to be about Japan, Japanese culture, but looking at this, here that they have. That was not really what I was focusing on. I'm sure that there was a lot of cross-fertilization um, that's inevitable, uh, particularly with the Scandinavian designers, uh, especially you know in the 60s and 70s. They had a tremendous following in Japan. Um, but again, I feel that a lot of the products that I chose may have some may have had some influence of those earlier precedents. However, in most cases, they've been somehow adjusted for the Japanese consumer or the Japanese home. In Japan, yeah. um, you know, it's certainly a word that's bantered about. Uh, does the average consumer know the word monozuki? Probably not. Um, and they're still the beneficiaries, though, of that process. So I don't think that it has tremendous marketability as, as a product in terms of the marketplace. You know, that designer is actually here at UCLA, UCLA so you can ask him tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know the answer. Uh, it's Atelier Bow Wow. Uh, Bow Wow is in the Well, thank you very much. Thank you.